bless you this morning. Let's all stand and sing that. Oh, and when I look into your reason to live this morning, to just worship him and praise him and all our lives to just be about him. Amen. Amen. Let's just bow our heads and this morning in prayer. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful to be gathered in your presence, Lord. And Father, we hear, Lord, as sheep of your pasture, Lord, and inviting you this morning that you may come and take the service into your hands. And Lord, and from the song to the preaching of the word, Lord, we like to hear from you this morning, Lord, and our heart panteth after you, Father. We pray that you may speak to our hearts. We love you and invite you this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to welcome everyone in the house of God this morning. All our visitors, we certainly welcome you. We invite Brother Mike for our psalm reading this morning. Amen. bless you.
We're going to go ahead and continue in Psalm 119 this morning. If you want to go ahead and turn there, we'll be picking up in verse 89, uh, reading that kind of that portion this morning. And as I was looking over that this week, that first verse really caught my attention. And it says simply this, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Think about that. What a statement. Thy word is settled forever. Amen. You know, I was thinking about that statement. When we say that something is settled, there's something final about that. You know, there's no question. It ends all question. There's no debate. It's done. As we sing in that song, it's already done. You know, I just was looking in Webster's Dictionary, listen even to the words that Webster's Dictionary uses to describe settled. It says to make quiet or orderly, to establish or secure permanently, to fix or resolve conclusively, to arrange in a desired position, to come to rest. That's Webster. But look at those words, rest, quiet, in order, in position, established, secured, arranged, positioned, fixed, resolved. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You know, I began to ask myself then, then why do I worry? Why do I worry about the outcome of my circumstance? Of any circumstance? Of any situation? Why do I feel like I have to put my hands on things to try to change or to say something to try to affect Thy word is settled in heaven. Do I need to help it? Is it settled or no? You know, Jesus, when he was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said in Matthew 6.10, he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We know that his will is his word. That's what we've been taught. You know, so if it's already settled in heaven, then all we need is to see that manifest in the earth, in this earth. You know, our prayer might be instead of I hope it goes this way, or may it go this way, or can you solve my problem, or can you meet my need? Be it unto me according to thy word. The word is already settled in heaven. You know, how many times did Jesus say, be not afraid, only believe? It's really just a question of whether this earth can get aligned with the word that's already settled in heaven. Where we get hung up, Where I get hung up is where I forget that that word is already settled regarding any circumstance and that I need to put some work to it. You know, be it unto me according to thy word. Let it be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, the question is, do we know what the word has declared and said about it? And are we willing? Do we believe? that ultimately this earth will match what's spoken and settled in heaven. You know, the portion of the psalm, the last verse, 96, David's observation is, I have seen an end of all perfection. You know what that means is the most perfect plans and efforts and creations of man, the best we can do, the best we can build, the best we can think, the best we can plan, all comes to an end. But thy commandment is exceeding broad. That means there's no end to it. I can't find the borders. I can't find the edges. You know, so 
As we read this portion of the psalm this morning, we're just going to read those eight verses, verse 89 and 96. Just, you know, it was a reminder to me that everything we see in this earth is just things being positioned to match what's already settled in heaven. And my prayer for myself is, be it unto me according to thy word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. Let's read that portion of scripture this morning, starting in verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Why don't we sing He Abides, He Abides this morning? Amen. Oh, I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk to bed from way.
Amen. Praise his name this morning. Amen. Brother Benoit has a special if he could come at this time. God bless you. Y'all help me sing it. Falling in love with Jesus, oh, falling in love with Jesus, oh, falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I Falling in love, falling in love with Jesus. Oh, falling in love with Jesus. Yes, Lord, falling in love. trust you've fallen in love with him this morning. Amen. Amen. This morning, it's so wonderful to have, amen, Brother Ben Chelly and Sister Gina this morning. We certainly welcome them this morning. Amen. They just got married last Thursday, and they're here in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Brother Ben wanted to sing a song, so if he could come at this time, God bless you. You 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. So long I had searched for life's meaning, enslaved by the world and my greed. Then the door of the prison was opened by love oh the ransom was paid and i was free oh i'm free from the fear oh i'm too much
Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're free this morning? Amen. Amen. I think it's time to celebrate our freedom. Amen. Amen. We have to be aware that we've been made free. Amen. Amen. Well, this time we'll invite the brothers that are taking the offerings. We have a request up here. Uh, first, I'd like to announce, don't forget, tonight is our communion and foot washing service. Amen. We all, all of you are invited. Amen. Um, uh, Brother Joella Villa writes, uh, God bless you, brothers and sisters. Please pray for a customer of mine. Uh, he uh, he's, has an illness on his foot, and I pray that God will touch and heal him. Please, uh, that he touch his foot and his heart. Uh, may the Lord come to his throne and touch him. Amen. That's his heart desire. We also want to remember what a Darian and the family at this time where uh, he lost his dad. We pray that you certainly the Lord will comfort them this morning. Amen. If you have a need upon your heart, just lift your hand up to him this morning. Amen. 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 Brother Tim Siler, if we could just come and take these things before the Lord. Amen. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, this morning that you hear the groanings of our heart, Lord, the murmurings of our speech. Lord, you're a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's many things, Lord, we could pour out before you. As we've sung this morning, the blessings, Lord, that you've rained upon us. You provided us a land full of milk and honey in the midst of a troublesome and a weary land. But Lord, we're the children of the promise. Your word says, as Isaac was, so are we children of promise. Lord, it was by that promise on Christ that we're able to receive those blessings. Lord, we want to surrender to you all of our worship, all of our praise. But Lord, we also come as your children, Lord, with needs. Lord, with comforting. Lord, just healing. We think of Brother Darian this morning, Lord. A faithful servant is dead, Lord being laid to rest Lord he's better off but Lord we pray for those that he's left behind just give us peace Lord faith and belief Lord that we'll all meet together very soon Lord we ask this morning Lord those that are in this assembly Lord as we leave this place Lord surely we've seen you lifted up Lord we ask that you just bless each one for their attendance this morning Lord we can't go out here the same person. But Lord, each one has traveled far. Lord, those that come from even next door, possibly. Lord, be a blessing to them all, we pray. But Lord, you work wonders when we get in your presence. Lord, the supernatural presence will never be the same. So Lord, all these needs, we just pray and ask, Lord, that you be with each one. Brother Well, Lord. Lord, when your word comes forth, May it strike fertile ground to spring up into everlasting life. Grant it to us now as we lift your name on high. We ask all these things and blessings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's just sing that this morning. Amen. Sister Julia, it's a special for us. Let's just sing that as she gets ready. Oh, yes, is, yes, is love.
that try to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense. So I come to tell you he's alive, to tell you that he dries every tear that falls. So I come to tell you that he saves, to show
bless you this morning. Miss Stan, this morning as we move into the wonderful presence of God's word. Uh, it's nice to have our special guests with us. Ben and Jenna, I guess last Sunday wasn't the last time. <laughs> God is so good to me. Preach, man. Brother Shelley, so nice to have you this morning. And wonderful presence of the Lord with us. Ben, you always bless me when you sing. I hope your pathways at least, it's a 50-50, isn't it? 50 <laughs> here, uh, 50 in Alabama. Is that good, brother? You go for that? Thank you, my brother. Your, smiles, your smile tells it all. <laughs> Uh, amen. Do you love God's word? You know, our whole existence is based on what was done for us at Calvary. Um, that one great sacrifice for sin set so many of us free. And there's only one place that God meets a man, and that's under the shed blood. You couldn't dance in the spirit. You couldn't lift your hand if there wasn't a blood sacrifice that was laid. And when this man died, all our sins were remitted. And there's no more consciousness of sin. And it, it's so wonderful. And that love, there's a song that we're going to sing when uh, we invite Brother George this morning. Here is love. Vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the prince of life, a ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Let's never forget it. What a wonderful thing that is done. So as we sing this this morning, Brother Billy will help me sing. Remember that. You're not approaching him this morning on your own merits. You're not approaching him because you have anything to offer. You're approaching him because he has a blood covering. That you can walk up in the presence of that blood and that's what he sees. He sees a forgiven sinner. He, see, he doesn't see what's been thrown in the sea of God's forgiveness. That blood gives us equal access this morning to that throne. So whatever request you have on your heart, whatever desire that you'd ask God to do, it's been purchased for you. This great love that we sing about this morning as we invite our brother to come. Is love as as the ocean loving as
reason that song is so special to me is because that is the song that characterized the Welsh revival. It was less than a year, started in 1904, ended in somewhere in 1905, because one man fell on his face before God. We need revival. And God blessed that island. People went from here over there, where, where is it, where is it? Looking for some big fantastic thing. It was in the individual. When that song was sung over there in their language, people fell to their knees in the streets. The bar rooms closed. Look it up, Welsh Revival, Brother Roberts. Such a beautiful song. Let's sing that first verse again. And just realize that our song only believed, but that was the song then. It caused great things over there. Here is love that says While you're standing, take your Bibles and open to Proverbs chapter 3. <coughs> We're going to have Sunday school this morning, and I know that everybody came hungry. <coughs> and you should always bring your Bible because you never know when the screen might fail you. It's electronic. Proverbs chapter 3. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them about the heart, about the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding and all the things you think you could figure out. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here in Texas today. Lord, we have people here from many different places, many countries, many languages, many customs. We thank you for the translators. We pray that you would bless them. But Lord, there's one thing that is the covering for all of us, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And here in the 21st century, we are under the umbrella of the Malachi 4 message that you have sent and vindicated and proved to be of God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We love Brother David. We just don't take this very lightly, but know that it's a serious uh, time, a serious situation. And we just pray that you would bless your word to your people. Let each one understand exactly what you're trying to say to them. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> we greet all of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And um, knowing that all things work together for good. It doesn't stop there. That's a comma. <laughs> for those that are called according to his purpose and those that love God. And if you love God, you love all his word. Amen. So this morning we're going to speak to you on a subject. The time is now. It's not yesterday, it's not when Brother Branham was here, it's now. Now is the time. And so I want you also to turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Yeah, don't put your Bibles away. We're in church. It's going to get serious here in a little bit. Yeah, and guess what? I brought the level. It's got two or three purposes. I'll let you guess what they are. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1, Jesus is um, with the disciples, 
they have left the temple. They're walking away from the temple now. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him and showed him the great buildings of the temple. Look how marvelous all what you know Herod has done, so marvelous. Jesus said, You see not you see all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon the other that shall not be thrown down. They didn't want to hear that. They're proud of their temple. He just took all the air out of their balloon. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so that's 600 yards away, now they're over the Mount of Olives, they're looking at the temple. The disciples came unto him privately, just, just them and the master. Tell us, just tell us privately, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered, I see sometimes the answer isn't exactly what you want to hear. But we're serving a God that can see all things of all time. He knows all your circumstances and where you came from and why you're here. What's the attraction on Central Avenue in Bedford? It's not personality. It's the word of God. So Jesus said to them, take heed. In other words, listen up, people, that no man deceive you. What's that got to do with the question? Lots. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many are going to walk away because they paid attention to the wrong voice. Okay, now go over to verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, oh, here's Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I told you, it's coming. You're already warned. Watch out. In another translation, it says, verse 23 through 25, Then if any man should say to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For there shall arise false Christs and lying prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the chosen ones. Behold, I've told you in advance. Amen. Now, quiet people don't scare me a bit. That means you're listening. And I don't know when I'm coming back. So listen up. So the level is here for a reason is to remind us to stay balanced. Now, we had a fantastic supper last night, and I tried to hold back and stay balanced, but I saw some other guys. You know, they, were, they were headed this way. You know. <laughs> we must stay balanced in what we eat, what we say. Our whole operation is to stay balanced here today, and especially those of you that are watching from the comfort of your home. We've got people that... They can't get in here. We've got four chairs here. But there's people watching. You need to stay balanced also and pay attention to what we're saying. Okay. So we're living in very dangerous times of church history. Now, we think that we're in marvelous times because, you know, we all have our little magic thing here that in touch with anybody in the world and find out any facts, any, anything, the whole world in your hand. You don't have to worry about TV anymore. It's right here. But... It's a deception. Be careful. And so we have every kind of distraction, every kind of deception. And um, we want to know how to identify the dangers, how to stay clear of them, and stay balanced. Okay? Now, this has another purpose. And those of you that were here last time, now don't be trying to fall asleep, buddy. Because if I see anybody dozing off, it's not my fault that you stayed up late last night. And we don't have a coffee bar here. But if I see anybody dozing off, I can buy another one of these, you know. So, Revelations 19, turn your Bibles so that you know we're not pulling some funny stuff on you here. Revelations 19, verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her... That's you. Not some angels. No, to, to God's bride, to his wife. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, 
clean and white. For the, linen, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That is coming very soon. Maybe tomorrow, maybe Friday, I don't know, but very, very soon. Okay? But in the meantime, today, right here in your daily life, here in Texas, wherever you're from, 2022, there will arise false Christ. Now, we spend a lot of time preaching on positive promises and building the faith of the people and getting things, you know, pushed forward. But I got news for you. There's some negative promises in the Bible that are equally uh, uh, equal weight, and they will come to pass whether you like it or not. We got to take all the word. When we go to the buffet, we don't just take the chocolate pie. No, you got to take all of it. You got to be right. You got to be balanced. You see. So there will arise false Christ. That's anointed ones, very anointed, and cause others to believe. Yeah, and lying prophets. Doesn't sound good, does it? Because we know about one prophet. Well, there's lying prophets also. Uh, so they don't all speak the oracles of God with pure heart, heart and mind in order to help God's people? No, that's not the intention of some people, you see. And they, the anointed ones and the lying prophets and preachers, will show signs and great wonders, great explanations, great opinions. So as with the intention of misleading, if possible, even the chosen ones. So the time is now. Now in Revelation 7, we have where the scriptures talk about the 144,000 Jews. That sounds like a lot of people but it's not. In Israel today, there's probably, well, yeah, in Israel, there's about 9 million Jews. There's more than that in New York. They're in Atlanta and Cincinnati and Dallas and everywhere. So 144,000 is just a small portion of the whole deal. It says right there in Revelation 7, of the tribes of Israel. We don't have to guess who they are. So there's not going to be one more and one less. There won't be any empty chairs. No, it's a perfect package, you see. And um, God is watching over his heritage. Now, in the natural, very few people know what tribe they're from, okay? There's some that do, many don't. But God does. He's got a computer that doesn't crash us. He's got, he's got a laptop that's always ready, you know? And um, he's in total control of all the details of their life and of our life, see? And so there's a great anticipation amongst the Jews even today. Yes, I've been there. I know some of these people. And uh, they will, the, the ones that are serious, They'll tell you, oh, the Messiah's almost here. But first, we'll see Elijah. They've been taught about Elijah since they were born. So they know what to, kind of what to look for. They're ahead of us. We didn't know nothing about Elijah. You see. Anyway, so it's about to happen. And then when we focus closely, we are a many-membered body. I mean, just right here. We've got languages. We've got colors. We've got everything. You see, people called out of the confusion of Laodicea. For his name's sake. Not to shine, oh, I'm so-and-so. No, for his name's sake. Okay? To show a living Christ to a dying generation. Okay? And then, but you see, God in his great wisdom and in his foreknowledge, he has predestinated a, a certain number called the bride. Okay? Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's why when you, uh, you know, you get all excited and you want to, testify to a neighbor or whoever, and they reject it, they're not part of the program. Not everybody's going. Not everybody carrying King James Bible is going either. I'm, I hate to tell you, but there's, there's three kinds of believers sitting right here. And don't worry about who the other one is. Who are you? <clears throat> so this bride, we don't know how many people it is. See, with the Jews, we know exactly the number, the number. With the bride, we don't have a clue. It's a lot uh, by comparison, but we don't know the exact number. But there won't be any extra chairs. Not going to squeeze, you know, 14 people in a bench that holds 10 people. No, there's a seat for every one of us. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so do, just do your part to be there. So the exact number, only God knows. Many are listening. Some are, you know, in other words, they're having church from Canada all the way to the South Pole right now. In Europe, Africa, they're already kind of getting ready for the evening service. In India, they've already let out. It's nighttime. So God is in control of all these things, okay? So we're living in very dangerous times. You can read the history. You can look at some movies and so forth. 
And thank God that you are living now. It could be a lot worse. But God has trusted you with his word to live in the darkest part of Laodicea and overcome the demons of this age. Because when we get to heaven, so I don't know who, you know, I'd like to think that, that in this crowd of, of 300 people or however many is here, that there's only one unbeliever and one make-believer. I don't know. I want to believe we're all going, you see. And when we get there, if they hand out T-shirts, we don't know. But if they hand out T-shirts, it's not going to be, you know, survivor. It's going to be overcomer. We are overcomers of dark Laodicea. And we are more than overcomers. You see, when there's a fight, only one winner, right? He gets the big buckle and he gets the big check, so he's the overcomer. But when he gives his wife the check, she's more than overcomer. And we are the wife. Okay. So, yes, very dangerous times. And um, God has us living here by his grace in this time of church history. We're not building an ark. We're not walking across the desert. We're looking for the exit of Laodicea. And yes, there will be overcomers. Now, 2,700 years ago, a Jewish prophet named Isaiah said, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, future tense, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Speaking of dark Laodicea, the time is now. So we are now in one of our darkest hours. I hate to give you the bad news, but it's facts. And it's when Matthew 24, 24 and other scriptures are coming into focus, you see. And um, it's, uh, it's a time for that fulfillment. It's not with the Pentecostals, Mormons, followers of Martin Luther, whatever. No, dear, right here amongst us, our friends, our loved ones, carrying these same prophetic manuscripts, carrying the same King James Bible. No, none of us is going to be swayed by some explanation out there. No, it's going to be right amongst us. So how dark is it? Well, and you know, you've heard me speak before, so don't fall asleep. It's going to get interesting here in a little bit. Um, a long time ago, 1959, um, Brother Brand was preaching in the islands of the Caribbean, and he had some Americans with him, and he was there two or three weeks. And so one day, one of the Americans had a uh, four-hour interview with him, and, you know, many years later, he's telling us about it. And so he asked Brother Brand, why do you say so much about 1977? Okay, first of all, all you math geniuses, that was 18 years in the future. Can we agree? So Brother Ram could have said, it's none of your business. But that wasn't the way he operated, no. He said, well, when I was looking into the stream of time, so he's looking at numbers, he said, it got to 1977, it was so dark. I didn't see how any believer could live in such darkness. That's why. Now, we've lived, I mean, there's people here that were born a long time after 77. <laughs> and so now we're 45 years this side of that dark time, 45 years darker, 45 years more corrupt, 45 years more subtle. It's only used three times in Scripture, always to do with deceit and sinful activity. So we're 45 years closer to the catching away of the bride, the secret catching away. We're not going to go out in a blaze of glory. Okay, secret catching away. So stay ready because you don't know what time. I don't care what they tell you and, oh, this date, forget it. I've heard those things for 50 years. Yeah, this date and that date. And those guys, they drift off, you know. No, we're watching for the secret coming. Okay, and after the secret coming of the Lord, after the secret catching away, there will people, there'll be people right here in this church having service thinking they're serving God. In every church, all these Baptist churches, they'll all continue having church. But the ministry, like me and a few of my friends, that's when we can retire. Okay. So they're going to say, well, what happened to those crazy people? You know, those strange people following that guy they said was a prophet. We're never seen again. So as a redeemed and anointed bride of Christ, God has provided us with this Bible. Okay. This is very, very important. It used to be a crime to carry a Bible. They burn people alive for even thinking about translating it. But we have it. Everybody's got one or two, you know. 
And so it's in our language. And we have the, the privilege that we can read between the lines. But before you get too excited and go off on your tangent, what you read between the lines has to be in perfect harmony with what's on the line. It has to be in harmony. He's provided us with a uh, prophetic ministry. Yeah. God sent gift of unquestionable accuracy. No wondering, no guessing. I wonder why. No, it worked, and it's real. But back to the Bible one more time. You know, Brother Branham was very careful about his Bible because this is God in printed form. And when he would travel, that would be the last thing in the suitcase so there's not a bunch of stuff on top of it. Okay? And he says, you look it up, he says, you don't ever put anything on top of your Bible. Not even my books, he said, which at the time there weren't too many books. Yeah, so be careful. You know, when I see somebody putting a songbook on top of their Bible, we might use this as a <laughs> weapon. I got a big one out in the car. But we have this ministry God has provided, and it's, it's real simple. Only believe. You don't have to memorize the whole book of Matthew or whatever. No, only believe. Real simple. The angel of God came from the throne of God, and he says to William Branham, you get the people to believe you. Nothing will stand in the way of your prayer. And he's using a man that can barely read. When he started out, his girlfriend would come up, here, honey, read this right here. And then he would preach. Yeah. I mean, is that the best? That's God's choice. Look at the 12 disciples. Is that the best we could find? That's God's choice. So we don't have an opinion in it. You see? So never put anything on top of God's word. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's only believe, and it's totally scriptural. Um, but, you know, with every move of God, there's twins. From the Garden of Eden till today, there's a twin that shows up with negative comments, negative attitudes. And so the best thing you can do with those people when you read or hear about them, leave them alone. It's just like the people out here on 183. When they kind of just have it all, fine, just drop back, let them have it. This is the only millennium they're going to have. It's not going to get no better for them. We're going to a better place. So these people that are uh, constantly throwing rocks at our message, leave them alone. Right. So he's provided us with all the instructions we need to walk right into the, the body change or prepare us for a resurrection. And it's very, very close. I don't have any personal insight. I'm just telling you about what I see. It's close. Okay. So there's some sitting here that won't see death. Some are going to go out of the way of the grave, like the brother this week, and many others we've heard about recently. But there's some here that will not see death. But a sweep will come over you, just like a breeze. And all of a sudden, wow, got black hair again. Wow, no spots. It's going to happen, people. It's not Walt Disney, it's real. You see? And then what will happen? Then we'll hear a knock on the door. And there's Grandma. There's Rebecca. There's the ones that are gone. And then we're changed, you see. So the day of the Lord will be in full effect. It's on the way. That's when the minister of God can retire, the first day of the resurrection. So the redeemed of the Lord are focused on that day. That's where we're headed. You know, we, we wish we could just drop everything. But no, you've got to occupy until he comes. And so we're looking towards that day the day of our full redemption, we are focused and keeping in step with God's Word, walking in the light that you have. Because each one of us, you know, Christians in progress, we each one have a little bit of different light, you know, maybe 10 watt, maybe 20 watt, 100 watt. We walk in the light that we have. And um, we want to maintain a balance as we move along. Now, in Acts chapter 3, open your Bibles again. We are mentioned in Acts chapter 3. Where is it at here? In verse 21, 321. Um, 3.20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, or like it says in Spanish, keep back, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So there's... 
included in that restoration of all things is the bride. Amen. We're being restored, not just to the day of Pentecost, but to Eden. Amen. See, And that, that's going on now. That's why you're here today. What, what can we do? We're looking in the mirror of the word. How do we get uh, ready a little better? So rest of all, restoration of all things includes the bride. Restore her to her, her original con condition as we were in the mind of God before he formed the planets. Now, see, we, we live here. And we, we have cars. We have freeways. We've got all this stuff. But have you, have you looked at the, the pictures? I mean, this ball is sitting in the middle of the air. Now, there's some really, really demented people on the planet that think that the planet is flat. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, the Flat Earth Society. They had a, a, a what do they call it? one of their uh, conventions three or four years ago, and they invited an a, uh, astronaut to come speak. Now, the astronaut's been out there. He saw this round ball. <laughs> that should have been interesting. So we, we have this ball sitting here in the air. It goes around just perfectly, you know. East is back here. West is there. North Star is right out there. Never moves. And the ball is right there. And it moves. And every day, you know. So before all that happened, we were in the mind of God. Okay. And uh, that's why we press forward with successful missionary work that is bearing fruit. The word is going into places I can never go. It's going, people are, are, are taking the memory stick with the message and they're playing it and people are being baptized. It's going on right now. There's, a, there's an active search for that last one, you see. And so God is calling people to repentance, calling them to baptism. We just dealt with a case last night. How do I become baptized? <laughs> Real simple. Come to church, we'll tell you about it. But. We read in the love letter that that special day will be preceded by a falling away from the truth. All this seems to be going fine, and we're headed to that, you know, that destination. But before we get there, there's going to be a falling away. Things are going to fall apart in some cases, you see. And so a falling away from the faith, apostasy, or rebellion. So any departure, any apostasy or rebellion must always begin from the inside, you see. Uh, and goes out and takes as many with them along the way. So that kind of activity never begins way out there. No, it comes from within. It's very subtle and engaging and very dangerous, and don't you dare think that you can do battle with them. Those are the devil's enemies. Those are the devil's, you know, his uh, lieutenants, enemies of the truth, and you're going to waste your time trying to do battle. It doesn't work. You're, you're no match for the devil. Because of you, you know so much, and you've read your whole Bible, and all this, fine. We don't have any business in that battle over there. Leave them alone, you see. And uh, you can't argue them with your logic. So the love letter also tells us over here in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and um, 32. Let's see what we got here. If I was one of those real good preachers, I'd have all this by memory said, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. In other words, Jesus is saying right here in red letters, you guys can do anything, say anything you want against me, I'll forgive you, no problem. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And we've got people in pulpits right now in America with this same Bible, speaking evil of what God has done. They're just digging their hole deeper every day. You know? So it's extremely dangerous. In Revelation 22, 18, you take one word out, put one word in, you're finished. Uh, what is it, Hebrews 6? If you've been here and you've partaken and you've memorized part of it and you've preached it, whatever, and then you go away, it's a one-way trip. There's no way back. So we love the word of God, others do not. It's just that simple. Now Jesus had to put up with some of the same stuff 2,000 years ago. Matthew um, 22 is where it says, they then went the Pharisees. Now, before you get too excited, the Pharisees were the best religious people of the time. Okay, it's just a warning. Um, they knew their prophet's words. They had a, a Bible, ended in Malachi, that was their Bible. It was a 200-year-old translation that was more friendly to them at that time. 
They had it by memory. They didn't have an iPad and iPhone. No, they read and memorized. They knew their prophet's words. But they were blinded for our sake, thank you. And so when Jesus comes along and is the fulfillment of these words they memorized, they just couldn't see it. So they went and took counsel. They got together how we might entangle him in his words, you know, trap him with a question. We still have Pharisees today, you see. And just like those back there, today we have people that know the letter quite well, but zero revelation, you see. If the message of God is not real to you today, in your soul, you will walk away one day. And we'll hear about it. You can't sneak away. We'll hear about it. <laughs> but to turn your back on the truth, one, you must misunderstood and you, you must misunderstand and reject the Bible promises. Okay? You gotta misunderstand and get scrambled. So the people that are walking away, and oh yeah, wait and brown. One day they're gonna leave the Bible also. They're gonna be at zero. You have to reject the supernatural indication. Yeah. The, this photo we got over here, that's a supernatural photograph. I've seen the original in Washington. And, and I've talked to the man that took the picture over here in Houston. He's gone now. So it's real. But people speak against it. So they're on the slippery slope. And according to Hebrews 6, that person is left with zero chances of returning. Because, see, God is the judge. Not me, not you. We are only fruit inspectors, you see. We have an inspector badge issued by the Holy Ghost. You know when you go to the market and you're going to buy peaches? Well, now there's some you don't, don't, don't even want to touch them because they're already soft. So you're inspecting the fruit. Okay, this one will be good. Or avocados, after all, you know, 300 other people have squeezed them. <laughs> We're just fruit inspectors. And we don't have to touch it. We don't have to say a word. Just back away. So God is in charge. He's the judge. Now, in John chapter 8, we have a, a scene that <clears throat> Jesus went to the temple ground. Now, when the, when the scripture says he went to the temple, the temple is small, about maybe half the size of this, but the people all gathered out there in the yard. That's where the people were. So he's over there in the corner of the courtyard with you know, a group of people, and it's early church. He's sitting there teaching a crowd of, of, of believers, and all of a sudden, who shows up but the twin? The twin always shows up, never misses opportunity. So here's a, a group of very arrogant Pharisees all men, and they got a woman by the arm. I mean, they got a death grip on her arm. And they drug her out of bed, so she's not dressed right, her hair's not combed or nothing. And, um, and they interrupt him. Ah, oh, we got him now. He's over there with those, those people. And we'll, we'll drag this prostitute over here. So they put her right in the middle, you know, right where everybody could see. And they posed a loaded question. And they probably each one had a few rocks in their pocket ready to perform what the prophet said to do. Kill his sorry outfit with a rock, you know. Yeah, they were ready. And uh, ready to judge. And so, um, because the Pharisees' job was to make Jesus look bad. Okay? And uh, let's see, where are we at? John chapter 8. And let's see here. In verse 4. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. We drug her out of the bed. I mean, that's what it says. Now, our prophet Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Are you, are you willing to contradict our prophet Moses? But see, they were only half right. Moses said, bring both of them. So this could have been a setup. They didn't bring the guy. You know? And uh, <clears throat> so they're trying to make him look bad. He acts like he doesn't hear him. He goes over there and starts scribbling, he's writing in the sand. We don't know what he wrote. It's not important, you know. And so they're kind of continue with their, with their accusation. And, um, and uh, they thought he was down there looking for a rock. Yeah. <laughs> and um, to help him fulfill the law, you know. Words, the literal words of their prophet. And so when they finish their accusation, he, he raises up. He heard everything. And he looked around, I'll tell you what, boys. The one of you that has never stole a pita bread, you never looked at a woman with any kind of bad thoughts of any kind, the one that's free from sin, throw the first rock. Well, of course, nobody qualified. 
So the scripture says they start tiptoeing out. Whew, we didn't think about that. <laughs> Let's get out of here. You know? And so Jesus had these things, you know? And he goes down and continues writing, but then he erased it all. Now, we've got to put that in because we've got people so narrow-minded. They think that the showbread is still over there someplace. We can go see it. They think we can go over there and see where Jesus wrote in the sand. Honey, 2,000 years have passed. Things change, you know. They've had 25 wars. So they, they started to just get away. By discernment, he was able to see her entire life, okay, just a flash. And he could see that she had representation in heaven. Now, yes, she had been on a detour. We don't know how long or why, but she had representation in heaven. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Once again, a woman received life from the life giver, okay? It turned her into a real lady, her heart filled with joy, she went away with hope to live a new life. That was where she had her encounter with the master. Her chains fell off. She was free. Romans chapter 8 says here, um, hold on. In Romans 8, one of my favorite chapters. No, I didn't memorize it. Therefore is, is therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who have believed all the word, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So she had this representation, you see. So that's a nice story. Now, what about you? Have you had your personal encounter? Or is it just your mother's story and grandma's experience? You know, it's got to be real. You see, God can, he sees all your circumstances. He knows all your story. And he can change your life, you see, for his glory. But it's got to be real in your life, in your, in your own self, not in grandma and not your mother and so forth. But we still have Pharisees today. We call them legalists, you see. So those people in Jesus' day had their prophet's message memorized perfectly. But they were out of balance, really out of balance. Now, we're not going to put it all the way this way because, see, this way is the long part of the cross. That's your prayer life. You want to get close to God? You pray, you read your Bible. Come to church. Okay. But if you maintain your prayer life, God will take care of the horizontal. Okay, moving right along. So they had all word, no spirit, no revelation, and they had memorized it by constant repetition. It became a form, you know, and they still do it today. Because from way back there, way back, every Sabbath, that's yesterday, every synagogue on the planet reads a part of Moses. They have their spoken word book. Yeah, they read that. Oh, yeah, we're all together. That's called organized religion. Not interested. Okay. So we must worship God in spirit and in truth. See, that's what he told the woman at the well. We were, God is looking for those who are worshiping in spirit and in truth, perfectly balanced. You see. So... Your life will reflect what's on the inside of you. You can't, you can't deceive a four-year-old. They can see right through you. <laughs> you know. And so uh, your life will reflect what's on the inside, no matter how much word you memorize and try to act like a Christian, because anybody up and down this avenue can read and repeat. That's not what it's about. It's about it coming alive. Okay, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I might not get invited back for a while, so we've got to get it all out today. Where's it at here? 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaks expressly, that means precisely, that in the latter times, that's today, now is the time, that some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith. We thought they were tight. They left giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? The uh, Lamza Bible says, misleading spirits and doctrines of devils. Of course, Schofield says seducing spirits. Well, yeah, misleading spirits, you know, doctrines of devils. So it's very serious. You better know where you stand, and having done all, 
stand. Do not engage in conversation with doubters. Those that don't believe what we believe, leave them alone. You're not going to change them. Now, your life is what you got to watch, you see. Um, uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot, of, a lot of women, they don't know why they have long hair or why they wear long dresses. But it's word of God, you know. So you act like a Christian. You be a Christian. If there's something in them to wonder, they'll ask. And you can have, a, have an answer. So, yeah, we are in very... Uh, very uh, difficult times. No conversation with doubters, negative people. See, that was the fatal mistake that Mother Eve made. And um, she listened, and then she responded, really? Oh, are you serious? And she got involved, tried to argue, and we're still paying the price today. Spirits don't die. Okay, back in your Bible. Second Peter chapter 1. One thing I want to tell you about Peter. Peter was ignorant and unlearned. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. Well, how did all this happen? Because he had some people helping him. He had some good people helping him. Yeah, that's the way I want it said. Yeah, and so they eventually come up with these two letters. Okay, where are we at? First Peter, or Second Peter, chapter um, 1. Let's see. Chapter 1 and verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. In other words, he prepared all this because he knew he was going to die, and I want you to, you know, have what I have. Why? Uh, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Now, see, that's not just something, that, uh, another opinion. No, cunningly devised fables, something to mislead by, by design, you see. When we may note unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. He knew what he was talking about. Now, he was ignorant and unlearned, but he got with some brothers, and one of them was named, named Sylvanius, I think, and they, they got his thoughts onto paper, and we have it here. And that's why it's very important. Many of you, some of you might not like it, but we have a church age book. Yeah, that's the message in a nutshell. There's what he wanted to say. Brother Bram never allowed any of his message to go out verbatim, you know, word for word. He wanted it sanded. He wanted it presentable. So these things may sound fantastic, maybe impossible to comprehend, but it's all truth. It's food for the soul. And so there in, in 2 Peter, or 1 Peter, where were we at? Let's go back there just a minute. 2 Peter, we were in... Um, uh, chapter 1 and verse 16. So look at 17 and 18. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice from him from excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Yeah, he was a, he was a witness. See, I'm not an entertainer. But I am a witness of a powerful message. It is real. Okay? Uh, Jesus said over in John 6, 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And he's talking to his disciples. He's giving them the, 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 the real important part here, chapter 6. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, their first impression, oh, we've got to, no, not eat his flesh. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, the disciples at that moment were kind of concerned. They're a little bit confused, but they stood steady. They knew this man came from God. They knew this was a supernatural ministry. They didn't get in his face with stupid questions like we have today. No, they paid attention. Did they understand? No, they didn't understand. But they were ordained to eternal life, chosen by the Lamb of God, they stood steady, believing that he knew what he was talking about. And they believed the supernatural. They had seen the unquestionable vindication. Now, Brother Branham was sent to us with a very simple verse. What was it? Something everybody could understand. Now, in one of my Bibles, over here in Hebrews 11, or where is it? Hebrews, Hebrews 13, um, there's a semicolon after... Verse 7. Verse 7 of Hebrews 13. 
Remember them which have the rule over you, so there's order, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, which would be Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, they're living what they speak. This verse doesn't just stand out there as a rubber stamp for everything. It, it has to do with the whole chapter, and that's to do with the way we act, the way we carry on our conversation. So he was totally vindicated, no question or doubt, only believe. It works. Yeah, just, just try it. You know, uh, I remember one day he, he, uh, he told me, he said, now, George, tithing does work. I have tried it, <laughs> and you know that it works. So there's, there's these things in the Bible that are real, and you just got to put them to practice. So the, the day of redemption is very near. Now, there's two things I want to point out here also about uh, Jesus and his day. You know, the first miracle was the wedding at Cana. Remember? He, got a, he and the disciples had an invitation to go to this wedding. It's a little village of Galilee. And so they go over there, and there's his mother and, you know, a crowd of believers. And so uh, <clears throat> they ran out of wine. Remember the story? Now, look at the details in your Bible. Read your Bible. The wedding was on the third day. Okay, Sunday's the first day. Monday's the second day. Tuesday's the third day. Why do they have weddings on the third day? Because in the book of Genesis, in the creation, on the first day, God said, it's good. Second day, it's good. But on the third day, he said, good twice. So the Jews take Tuesday for a favorite day to get married. Anyway, so he's there. They ran out of wine. And they go, Mary, Mary, what do you do? Whatever he says. And so they had these big water pots. You know, they're huge. Maybe bigger than those drums. And he said, well, first thing we're going to do is fill these six pots here with water. Okay, whatever you say. Now test it. Now this wasn't hours later. It was immediate. Wow, that's good stuff. Should have had this at the beginning. And uh, <clears throat> so he, cr he created wine from water. Now, in Jeffersonville, many years ago, <clears throat> one of the believers at the tabernacle lived next door to a man named Mr. Hill. And Mr. Hill belonged to the Church of Christ, so-called. And so the brother, whatever his name was, he was always, hey, come on, church with me, you know. Well, finally, Mr. Hill says, fine, I'll go to church with you tonight. Well, it just happened to be communion night. So there's open communion and there's closed communion. Closed communion is just us. We shut the door and it's just us. But open communion, if you say you're a believer, sure. If you, if you lied, well, it's going to be on you. It's not on me. And so they have open communion. And so they, um, uh, they stand at the rail and they come by with the bread. And the next guy comes by with the wine. Okay, so they're a little over half done with the congregation. And Brother Neville says to Brother Branham, uh, Brother Branham, we're out of wine. Well, this is kind of embarrassing. So Mr. Hill, he's right there where he could see and you know, hear it. So Brother Branham says, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just pray. That's a great idea. So, you know, the Bible says watch and pray. So Mr. Hill, he, you know, <laughs> he's got one eye open. <laughs> And he's, he said, I saw those little glasses fill with wine as he prayed. From nothing. So he couldn't go back to church of Christ. He became a believer. <laughs> so the redemption, the day of redemption is very near, okay? How far? It's close. Just take my word for it. When? When we, the believers, the redeemed, find that last eagle. That's how we got this missionary here from uh, Africa, good friend of mine from many years ago. We were both young and good looking way back then, <coughs> brother Jim. And there's there's work going on that you don't hear about, but it's going on, searching, searching. And when we find God's last eagle, you see, so God's program is right on schedule. And by the way, His schedule doesn't really include handing out tracts at the mall and to stoplight. No, that's not it. No. Passing out literature is not preaching the gospel. It's a, it's a kind of a hobby, maybe. But you want to get serious about what he said? 
new ministry, 1959. God knew that we'd be sitting here 10 million years before the world was ever founded. When there was nothing, no planets, we were already in the mind of God, and he knew you'd be sitting here. And so <clears throat> he says, the infancy of God knew every fly, every gnat. So we could add the cockroaches and the, the mosquitoes and all these things. And every time each one would bat their eye and how much tallow that would produce before the world was ever formed. That's the infinite God we serve. And so he says here, well, if he knows all that, why are you preaching? Because see, you, you can get out of balance with, with uh, predestination. Oh, well, we'll just, we'll just sit down. Why, why do we go through all this stuff? Just sit down and let it happen. No, that's not the way it works. Um, if God knows all that, why are you preaching? It's part of God's program. Preaching is his program. Want to say what he said? You're on. When he looked at the disciples or the apostles, see, there's a difference. Apostles is one thing. Disciples are followers. So these were, these were disciples following the Lord. But then they became apostles, sent out, missionaries. He looked at the harvest. He said, you know, the harvest is ripe. The labors are few. You all need to pray to the harvest, Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest. Well, why would they have to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest if the Lord of the harvest was standing there knowing how it would be done? Great question. He says, listen, God has so arranged it that his program cannot move without you and I. This church out here isn't going to raise automatically. It's got to be a group effort. So he so arranged that his program cannot move without you and I. As long as we're not doing what God leads us to do, we're paralyzing his program. But when the church moves under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, then we're in God's will doing his program. So preaching is his program. No more argument. Whose program? God's program. The God of heaven and earth. Not my program, not David's program, God's program. So we would do very well to put our little program aside, you see, and get in line and in step with his divine program. Because God sent his fourth Elijah to this generation according to the divine plan to turn the hearts back to the original. This glorious message that we have is the vehicle that takes us back. Okay? The first church age messenger said over here in 1 Corinthians 3, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as the wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. See, he knew who he was. I have laid the foundation, and another one builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's why the fifth messenger, Martin Luther, came along in the midst of a lot of stuff. He said, Christ alone. Very important. So who are these labors together in the first sentence? Look real close in your Bible 41 pages later in Ephesians chapter 4. You got permission to open your Bible? Where's it at here? Ephesians 4, where Paul, being a very intelligent person, he wrote one sentence, okay? Starting in verse 11, it's one sentence. And he gave some apostles, some uh, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, acting like children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine that comes by, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together perfectly and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Second time, in case you missed it the first time. 
So that's one sentence. He was a smart man. But it's the gospel all right there, you see. So why do we have these ministries? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And they all work balanced and in harmony. Amen. We don't have prophet over here and evangelist over here and, and pastor. No, they work in harmony. Okay? Brother Ram says over here in Perseverance, 1962. I believe that there's a church coming into that perfection. Amen. Now, friends, this was 60 years ago. Preaching to people that didn't consider, there was no such thing as a bunch of believers. There was Pentecostal people he was preaching to, some Baptists and whatnot. I believe there's a church coming into that perfection, that ministry of perfection, where the offices were apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, for the perfecting of the church. Those pastors and teachers and so forth will be so in tune and balance with the word until the whole thing will work right up to the coming of the Lord. I believe that, and I believe that we're nearing that time. I believe it is so. Now is the time. Are you listening? They all work in harmony and balance, just like these musicians. Now, you've got, you got three violins, you've got the organ, you've got the piano, you've got the guy beating on the thing over here. Okay, so they've got to work together. There's no very important, oh, it's all about me. No, you don't see that up here. And the ministry works the same way, you see. Uh, under one anointing, anointing of the Word, the Spirit of God. All others out there, whoever that's out there, uh, that are out of balance with the Word, attracting people to themselves. Yeah, in 2022, this wasn't in 1950, but now. They don't qualify under this, this uh, uh, verse here because they're not, they're not part of the team, you see. God is not responsible for their foolishness, their tantrums and their explanations. But individuals must appear on the scene to produce fulfillment each part of God's eternal word spoken by prophets. Amen. Yeah, but the Bible is ancient. And we got a man over in Rome who wants to write a new Bible. Really? Man, that man is supposed to be wearing the sandals of the fishermen. Those of you that's Catholics, you know what I'm talking about. He's supposed to be walking in, in, in Peter's footsteps. And he can't even repeat the word right. Well, who's going to trust him with a new Bible? doesn't work. We don't need a new Bible. No. Uh, we may be smarter. We may, may be better informed today. we got better stuff, greater buildings, but way out of balance with God's program. We've got to get back in balance. In 1964, the prophet said, if this all continues the way it is going right now, in 50 years it will be total insanity. That circle was closed in 2014. So what you live in out there and work, Total insanity. If you don't believe it, try driving out there. So <clears throat> that is why we see such horrible things happening in our world. Total insane people everywhere, you see. And um, he also says that it will become spiritually insane because we live in pleasure mad Laodicea. You know, and um, we want the thermostat just right. We want the car just right. Everything's got to be just right. You know, it's crazy. And so we need to get away from our sense-bound existence. You know, search that phrase too, sense-bound existence. So recently, in a, uh, about five years ago, I think it was, in a period of three years, 138 students were shot dead in a three-year period. Sounds bad. Too much TV, too much make-believe. But guess what? During that same three-year period, over six million babies were murdered by abortion. Yeah, in the United States. I'm not talking about the world. Okay? Yeah, right here. So we have no business telling anybody on the planet how to run their country or advising on human rights. We are some of the worst. So our messenger was brave, and he entertained questions from the audience. And the questions and answers on the, on the seals on a Sunday morning says, would the bride of Christ have a ministry before the rapture? Good question. Sure, that's what's going on right now. The bride of Christ, certainly. Uh, he, it is the message of the hour. The bride of Christ. She consists of a bunch of ugly people. No. She consists of apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. He identified it. It's the bride of Christ. Sure, she's got a ministry, great ministry. 
It's the ministry of the hour. It'll be so humble. So a lot of people will miss it and put it somewhere else. Now, there's only two forces. We're almost finished here. We've got, see, there's no clock up here, so too bad. It'll all be there when you get there. If you go to sleep, we'll start over. There's only two forces directing all the activities on the planet right now. Every one of you is listening or following a spirit. In every activity, every waking moment, either following God or following Satan. It's, it's just that plain, A or B. So we're free human beings. We're free in this country to make choices. And it's every moment of every day. It's very serious. But balance is not an option. You must stay balanced because you start going just a little bit. It doesn't work. You've got to stay balanced. Brother Bram says, you follow the scriptures. See if the spirit follows the scripture. Any spirit that does not follow the scripture is a wrong spirit. Now, he doesn't say to compare with personalities or whatever. No, scripture. That's right. If it goes beyond this Bible, it's a wrong spirit. If it doesn't get to it, it's a wrong spirit. You see. So if the devil can't keep you from seeing a truth, he'll push you overboard. See, That's his business. He will go off. Uh, that person will go off into some fantastic, or he'll keep you from seeing it at all. But to stay right straight on Calvary, it'll always come back straight back to the Word. Stay balanced. So the Scripture says over in James 2 that demons believe and tremble. Just because you got ready and came to church and didn't go to the beach or wherever, you know, that's, that's great. But the devils, they believe and tremble. Unfortunately, we have people today carrying this same book, same Bible, and so forth, claim to believe, they believe something, but they're so calloused by sin and unbelief here in Laodicea, they don't know what the Bible says or the booklets they carry, and they don't cry and they don't tremble. God has a provided way. Brother Bram says, friends, I've always tried to keep a balance of the road. You get way off on formalism, just as formal and ritualistic as they can be, people grab for that a lot. Then if you don't watch you get plumb over on the other side and be just as fanatic as you can be. But there's a middle of the road where the true, sound, sane gospel is preached. And God moves there, vindicating the truth. Straight is the gate, narrows the way, few there be that find it. So consider this. Redeemed individuals are waiting on the coming of the Lord. That would be us and people around the world. We're saved by grace, believing and depending on the atonement of Calvary. Only God has the list. Now remember, we're only fruit inspectors. We're not judges. <laughs> the bride members are paying attention to the ministry that God has placed in the body. So neither you nor anybody else can take out what God has installed. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 20, uh, 12, 32, one word against it, you're finished. Be careful. And number three, the elect of God are, it's a direct quote, we are waiting in love for the promise of the age to be confirmed. Amen. If you were here 30 days ago when I was here, we, we spoke about that. Waiting in love, not with a stick and not with, you know, no. Waiting in love for the promise of the age to be confirmed. She's watching for it. She is part of that word. And she's watching for her life, not all these people, her life, to manifest that word. <clears throat> but we're still, see, we're up here getting towards the top of the pyramid. We're in the age of perfection. And we're looking, oh, yeah, you need to, well, and what are you doing? You know, no, look at yourself. Am I ready to go? <laughs> Hebrews 11, all these having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God provided a better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. God had to have a people that he could trust with the revelation of his word, you see. So they're waiting for us. We hold the key. They're waiting for us to get in line, get in, get in step. You see, we hold the key. And so many times today there's people wasting time, wasting money on foolishness, not getting ready to go, building bigger and better. You know, now, you all need a bigger church, obviously, but we're talking about foolishness out there, you know. So it's because we still have three kinds of believers. Only in heaven there will be no make believers, no unbelievers. You won't have to watch what you say. It will all be peace. <laughs> Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that would come those along that claim to be anointed 
and appear to be very special because they say things like, follow me, single file, I know the way. But Jesus told us in advance, do not believe such people. Then a few years later, Paul came along and gave us the words over in 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because he had to deal with a lot of stuff. Okay, let's see here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit or uh, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, which means that there was people out there with fake letters, you know, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Remember Jesus over there in, in uh, Matthew 24? No man deceive you. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. So we are looking to that day, but before we get there, there's going to be a falling away from the truth. So here in this day, I say this day, this scripture is being fulfilled. Amen. You see, there are forces operating through people, slowly removing the deity out of the name of Jesus Christ. And there are also people actively engaged in bringing fulfillment to these verses of 2 Thessalonians. It's happening. Brother Brown said in 1955, as Moses went with that judgment stick before him. So here's this stick he found on the desert. Okay, he got this stick. As Moses went with that judgment stick before him, that same stick tonight to the church is Jesus Christ. If those Egyptians could have ever got that little simple stick out of Moses' hands, they would have had him whipped. And when the devil can never get the deity out of the name of Jesus Christ, he will have the church whipped. These aren't words to fill up the tape. This is a prophet speaking. These things are happening today. There's people with this same Bible. Oh, Jesus wasn't God. Well, I think we'll just have to go to the Bible and find out. The prophet says he was, so we don't have to listen to you. You know. So quickly get away from such dangerous borderline of unbelief. You see, Eve did not plan on going into such depths of unbelief. She listened, she reasoned. Oh, well, you've been here longer. Maybe you know what you're talking about. Well, look where we're at. Perversion, everything, you see. So none of the individuals who have turned their back on the truth that we treasure, not a one of them planned to go that far. They really believe that they're right. But one day, they'll have to close the Bible also because they can't go any farther. So it's already predicted, but it's not going to be smooth sailing. Troubled waters ahead. And um, so we always thought, yeah, it'll be way out there. No, dear, now. Now is the time. But I thought everybody carrying these books and quoting our prophet would be worthy of our confidence. Well, I wish. But you better discern the spirits. It's another good tape. Discernment of Spirit, 1960. Covers it all. In the day it's Jesus, they had the, the Pharisees. They knew their prophet's message to the letter. They knew when you left out of the or whatever. And um, they were leaning very heavily on their understanding, you see. And we have the exact situation today. People today, very important people, calling for single, single file believers. When Brother Brown says, let's arm up this way, across, make a sweep. But we're calling for single, single line uh, believers, which means... Take a number, go to the back of the line, don't ever raise your hand, shut up, follow. That's not God's program, you see. How can this be happening? Very simple. God's map is all on one page. I know that doesn't even sound reasonable to some of you young people. But it used to be we had a map book. Yeah, sold it over at Walmart for $12.95. And you want to go from Texas to Arizona, well, let's see how we're going to get there. The map book's in alphabetical order, the states. So if you're going to go west, well, then you've got to find, well, let's see, Texas. Well, then, well, there's New Mexico. Well, that, man, Arizona's clear at the front of the book. God's map is all on one page, okay? Paul wrote, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. In the Spanish Bible, it says, indiscutiblemente. That means unarguably. Great is the mystery of godliness. So we have super intelligent people today, and um, they're always ready to argue and make it a matter of controversy. I know them. Yeah, friends of mine. But the time is now for the fulfillment of these scriptures. 
Now is the time for the manifestation of every seed according to its kind. The scriptures cannot be broken. They cannot be stopped. It's in movement. Our God is on time, and he's all about balance everywhere. Our canary brain cannot interpret the mind of God. If you don't like the canaries, but a chicken brain. It's pretty small, you know. But God speaks through his anointed prophet. God fulfills his word. It's always on schedule. The time is now when this prophetic word is in effect. It's always been the case from the beginning, from the church age, from the first church until today. Brother Branham says over here in the church age book, in every age we have the exact same pattern. So it's going to repeat. That is why the light comes through some God-given messenger in a certain area, and then from that messenger spreads the light through the ministry of others who have been faithfully taught. But of course, all those who go out don't always learn how necessary it is to speak only what the messenger has spoken. They add here, they take away there, and soon the message is no longer pure. The revival dies down. How careful we must be to hear one voice. Be careful. For the Spirit has but one voice, which is the voice of God. Paul warned them to say what he said, even as Peter did likewise. So we've always had voice of God on the planet someplace. He warned them that even he, Paul, could not change one word of what he had been given by revelation. How important it is to hear the voice of God by way of his messengers and then say what has been given to say to the churches. So we as ministers, we're not innovators. We're not out here inventing and and changing things. No, we're just trying to repeat what he said. Just stick with the program. You know, to build this church out here, there's a very expensive set of blueprints. And whoever comes to work, well, I think there ought to be an outlet here. And I, we don't care what you think. You got to stick with the blueprint. So that's the way it is here. We got to stick with what the blueprint. You see, and uh, we're not money gatherers. We're not the managers of God's bride. No. We're not seeking to control everything. A minister anointed with the Spirit of God genuinely trusts God for everything, and he's not a micromanager. So we are simply repeaters sent out to encourage the bride of Christ. But sometimes we've got to bring some bad news like today because these things are happening. Okay, Our job is to make Christ real to the people for the perfecting of the saints. We are public servants, just like the garbage man. He's a public servant, the policeman, whatever. And um, we, uh, we don't deviate from the blueprint. we got to stick with it, not to improvise. Okay, 1950, the prophet says, Lift up your heads. Redemption is drawing nigh. Get ready. Signs and wonders appearing. Critics, infidels waxing worse and worse. Look at back then. What would he say today? We've got to put up with them. But we're not looking to them. We're looking to God. So the time is now. Friends, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on getting ready and getting out of here? What are, you re what are you reflecting in dark Laodicea? He says here, you remember, church, that you're living in the best day that you will ever live in right now until Jesus comes. It shall gradually, and then he changes, not gradually, rapidly get worse and worse. So when, when we see these things, when we, we, we see it happening around us, what are we going to do? We're going to run away and go off to Montana or Canada? Or, no. Are we going to call 911? We can change churches. Well, that happens. Well, too much pressure here. I think I'll just say him. <coughs> we can call headquarters. Hey, we'll show, what we'll shoot tonight. Do now. Oh, lift up your head. Redemption is drawing nigh. Luke 21, 28. All this is predicted to be. Everything that happened to Jesus was predicted. There was no surprises with God. It was all mapped out. So when these things happen, just look up. You can't change this. You can't help it. He says here, and they have to call us bad names. Oh, why? Why can't we just have get along? They have to call us bad names. They have to call the truth bad names. Jesus said, whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. When he's doing the very same thing, you see done. But whosoever shall speak against the Holy Ghost, when it comes to do the same thing, will never be forgiven in this world. They have to do that. There has to be a message like that to make people make fun of it, to show God's justice, to condemn the whole world and destroy it. While there's mercy and someone standing in the gap, Jesus Christ, and an open door tonight, won't you receive him, my friend? Won't you get yourself straightened up and start at the foot of the cross? 1961, Abraham and his seed after him. 
Do you know what God did? He reached out with his hand and stopped it. He is holding time in his hand for the church to make itself ready. There's a few members yet to come into the body of Christ. Maybe one of them's here today. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm led to be here, is to persuade you. I'm not saying don't be a Catholic, don't be Methodist. I'm not saying that. But I want you to be filled with this spirit. Just remember, I'll meet you on that day. And these words will be a witness against you. It's all on God's tape recording with his great picture camera. And you sitting there walking away and leaving it, you'll see yourself on that day in the mirror of God. He says, the gospel and the power of Almighty God has spread around the world. And the separation time is now taking place. God is calling a bride. The devil is calling a church. Let me be part of that bride. You have a choice. It's not over yet. You still have a choice. So the time is now. Don't let another hour go by without getting totally serious. Be sure this is not just something you learn and you repeat it. And um, like I was telling you before, they read a portion of their prophet's message every Saturday in the synagogues. And we've come around a similar situation. It's got to be alive, you see. So we must know the reality of the living God. So you must be born again to partake in the kingdom of God. And uh, <clears throat> the word has come to a place where God has brought you to a place where you need to be, to be restored, you see. That's the ministry of Elijah, to restore. Um, place us in correct position for the resurrection and the rapturing of a special people. Now, a couple more things. In the third seal, now notice that God told Eve that after a long, after so long a time, the word is coming back to you. Now, how did she fall? I want my class to say it. What did she fall from? The word. The word. And God said he would make a way to redeem her back to the word again. After so long a time, the word would be made known to her. All right, the word would come back for one purpose. Now hold that, what I'm saying. The word would come back to her for one purpose, for redemption. He says, Jesus overcame by the word. Eve fell to the personal temptation of Satan by, falling, by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word. But Jesus overcame by the word. And right now, let me say this, is the only way to be an overcomer. It is the only way that you can know if you're overcoming because the word cannot fail. So to stay balanced, we got four steps. You read your Bible, okay? If you just read a chapter a day, read your Bible. Listen to 20 minutes of God's anointed prophet. There's other preachers on the radio, yeah, but listen to the prophet. Read a page in your church age book. It won't hurt you. And you pray, even when you're stuck in traffic, you pray. You create your own personal atmosphere. With these steps, you will prosper as an individual, and you'll prosper as a body of believers. As the musicians come, James 4 says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The next verse, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. But you have a part to play. It's not so automatic, you see. God is not unreachable. Unreachable. He loves you. He cares for you. So in closing, pay attention. If you don't read, if you don't take anything else away from here. How can a believer avoid the traps and side roads that Satan has so smoothly prepared? The solution is right here in your Bible. You know, Paul traveled about 10,000 miles in 30 years. He didn't have an SUV. He walked and had a horse. And uh, he spent some time in an area known as Galatia. Had some converts. They believed, they were baptized. But in a very, um, a few months later, he comes by, the twin had showed up, just like in the time of William Branham. I knew the, some of the twins. And so um, Paul comes back to check on them a few months later and um, to check on the believers. No cell phones, how y'all doing? No, he had to go there. And he came back. What do you think he found? The twin had come by and caught the attention of some of them. And so he's speaking to them. And over here in, in chapter 1 of Galatians, he says, 
I marvel, I'm surprised that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, cause confusion, and, um, and, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But if I come back next week, if Silas comes, if, if William Branham comes, if David McGeary, if George Smith, or if an angel, boom, and bring something different than what I already gave you by revelation, don't accept it because he's going to the hot place. So the only thing that's real is what is squared with Paul's gospel. May God have mercy. Let's stand together. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. I believe it's on your computer there someplace. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Sweet spirit. Sweep over my soul. My rest is to end this on a happy note, let everything go away happy. But you've heard truth. Now what you do with it is another story. There's a country far beyond the starry sky. Oh, there's a city where there never comes an eye. did something this week, and she's got the same initials, <laughs> but now it's Jenna Shelley. Shelley, we love you. So I want you to get your man and go stand at the back door, and everybody's going to come by and tell you how much they love you. <laughs> Once again. In that city where the land is high, in that city where the crowd has grown high, I'm a man to go there and bring his I'm going where the land is high. Amen. Now, if you just happen to 
have a few little dollar bills you want to stick in uh, Ben and Janice's hand. That would just be all right with me. Okay, just, you know, they're fixing to go on their honeymoon. Very rarely do we get a, a married couple to be able to be with us in service. So I just think it's awesome. I think it kind of shows where the heart's at. Don't that's you, right. brother? Amen. What's that's number awesome. one? So I think that's great. So don't be afraid just to, if you've only got a nickel, give them a nickel. Maybe they can buy a, what, can you buy anything for a nickel? I don't know, Give, but they'll, maybe they'll add up. So just, just show your love to them, and we really appreciate it. We appreciate having all our visitors here. But I think when we sum up this morning, I think we realize that the weight of it falls on each of us as individuals. It's not going to be a group thing. I like being in groups. You can hide in a group. But when we stand in that light, it's just going to be what our thoughts were, what our actions were, where our affections were, and what we had first in our lives. Uh, and, you know, in this whole society we're in is so instant. And, you, you know, that we just hardly wait on the Lord anymore. Just get alone in his presence and let him speak to you and talk to you and, and look at your life in the mirror and, and, and see how that you can go farther. Examine yourself and, and line yourself up with the word. Amen. We live by the word of God. So let this morning, as we covered so many scriptures, but let it set with us in our hearts that I've got a responsibility. I got a responsibility to myself to make my life right because I have to remove the beam from my own eye before I can even approach the sliver in someone else's. I've got to make sure my light is shining bright and my lamp is trimmed and clear. I've got to set myself down for personal examination. And there's so many things out there to distract us from that. We can overwork. We can overdo a lot of things, but we can over pray. And so I hope this morning that each of us makes a commitment to the scriptures and to our own personal life hid in Christ. And I think if we do that, I think we'll see a a candle set on a hilltop. And that one that's lost that we're waiting for, he may see a light, just like Moses saw a burning bush, and he was attracted to that light. May your life be so set aside in the Lord that someone's attracted to you, to what hope it is. And this morning, if you're not as close to him as you ought to be, he hasn't went anywhere. He's right where you left him. He never took a step away from you. But if you draw nigh unto him, he'll draw nigh unto you. So as we go and you greet our lovely newly wedded couple, remember that you're wed too. And you have a husband to serve. And his name's the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's little have such a, a a great dedication as we go this morning. We'll sing this song as our dismissal song this morning. So let us bow our heads one more time in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we've assembled here from many places. Many are of our fellow believers from our neighboring state of Alabama have come. Father, to spend this time with us. But Father, they return home to their battlefield where you have placed them to spread the light and the good hope and the hope of the delivering power of the cross at Calvary. We ask that you bless them, Father. 
May they prosper and be in good health. Father, may they multiply. Father, may they have fruits of their labor. And Father, may you bring them and guide them ever closer to the true word of God, that they might grow in wisdom and knowledge. Father, for all our visitors from wherever they come, may this same hope go with each of us. For those that are here local, Father, may we ever become more dedicated to the truth of your word, the solemn holiness and sacredness of the gospel. May we get not caught up in the flighty laughter of Lady Osea, but may we rededicate our hearts and rededicate our lives. May we realize the importance of the closing hours of time. And may we keep in sight the great reward that waits for those that serve him. Be with us now as we go. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Brother Billy. You alone Oh,